I'm Hillary Hendershot, your host, and this is The Retirement Years on Profit Boss Radio, episode 145. The Retirement Years on Profit Boss Radio is your weekly wealth building and retirement mastermind. Profit Boss is also a movement for women who want to reach their full wealth potential and be financially free. Let me be your guide as you defy the odds, take control of your money, grow your wealth, and retire well. Do you want the secrets of wealth and retirement to be yours? This is the place. I'm Hillary Hendershot. I'm a certified financial planner running a leading advisory firm for women and couples, and I'm sharing with you real stories from real life and real people who are making it happen. Forget Wall Street. You ready? Let's do this. Welcome to this episode of Profit Boss Radio on an extremely timely and unfortunately extremely scary topic. I have with me author Adam Levin, the founder of Cyber Scout and the author of a book called Swiped. You're going to want to grab a copy of this book after you listen to this interview. Adam is a nationally recognized expert on cybersecurity, privacy, identity theft, fraud, and personal finance. He's distinguished as a fierce consumer advocate for 40 years He's the former director of the New Jersey Division of Consumer Affairs, Levin's chairman and founder of CyberScout, and co-founder of Credit.com. Hmm, that's a big site. We'll talk about that. He is author of the critically acclaimed book, Swiped, How to Protect Yourself in a World Full of Scammers, Fishers, and Identity Thieves. He's a man on a mission. He's a graduate of Stanford University and the University of Michigan Law School. He's a highly sought after speaker. He shared his expertise with numerous state and federal regulators and legislative committees and appeared before a wide variety of organizations, including government, law enforcement, public interest, education, human resources, insurance, and financial services throughout the United States and Europe. Adam, you're a busy man. Welcome to Profit Boss Radio. Hillary, thanks for inviting me, and I'd like to get to know that guy you just introduced because I'm impressed. Yeah, he's credentialed. <laughs> he's 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 got stripes on his on his shoulders on his uniform there. So good, welcome. Thank you so much for being willing to share your expertise. I have read through your book. First of all, how can we get people engaged in this conversation? Why should they be worried? And how big is the problem? Well, what's always interesting is when someone says to me. Why should I be worried? I mean, I'm just a regular person. And I say to people, to you, you're a regular person. But to a hacker, a fisher, or an identity thief, you're Kim Kardashian. Because oh. you have what they you have what they want. You have data, you have financial information, you have credit card information, and they can use your data to commit so many different crimes. They can open new accounts in your name get medical treatment in your name, file fake tax returns in your name, and then get the refund diverted to them. They can commit crimes with the trail of breadcrumbs leading back to you. They can use information about your children and commit identity theft. They can do what's called synthetic identity theft, where they take your social security information, someone else's name and address, a third person's date of birth, put it all together and create a bionic person. So... Everyone is in the crosshairs. I always say to people, look down, and if you see a little red dot somewhere on your blouse or your shirt or your tie, that's not ketchup. That's a sniper scope, unfortunately. <laughs> I'm laughing, but it really is a serious issue because these are things, if you really become a victim of identity theft, this can follow you for years. It can plague you everywhere you go. It could make it so that you can't get on airplanes or get credit cards or buy a house. Am I right? What am I, what am I not saying? Well, what you're not saying is that it can disrupt your life to the point where you become almost dysfunctional. You become more paranoid about the world than many of us already are. And you realize that it, it doesn't end. Like, for instance, you can do everything right as a consumer And we're going to be talking about the three M's, Mm -hmm. how do you minimize your risk of exposure, monitor, manage the damp, but you can do everything right. But if you're on the wrong database at the wrong moment and the wrong person gains unauthorized access and billions of files, that's Dr. Evil, pinky to the lips, B, billions of files containing, in some cases, the most intimate information you can imagine 
background investigations for security clearances, medical information, personal information about psychological situations. That could be in files that are breached. And if it's out there and if your social security number is part of it, you're going to be looking over your shoulder for the rest of your life because let's assume for the moment they arrest the bad guy, which is almost impossible. But let's say they do it. That doesn't mean that that person hasn't already taken that information and sold it to somebody who then used it and then sold it to somebody else. So not only are you a target, but here's something even scarier. And that is, it's not just about us sometimes. It's about the fact that we could be a tributary to a much larger river. So they may not be gunning for you per se, but they might want to get your spouse, your partner, your business colleague, get into your company, get into an organization, using your information to confuse a network to believe that it's really you, but it's them. Yeah, okay, you have me you have me on edge. You have me nervous. So you have a chapter titled The Problem is the Solution. What do you mean by that? What I mean is that the it's it's really it's about authentication. How do you how do you accurately authenticate yourself realizing the fact that w without further evolution into biometrics mm -hmm. that it's not only a problem of how do you authenticate an individual but how do you make sure that the individual that is communicating with a network or a system is actually the real person? Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the questions that I think are people that are top of mind for people. And then I want to get to this framework that I think is really valuable and important, which is the three M's. So right. uh, when you have your credit card stolen, so first of all, we all know that Thieves can get your credit card number without stealing your credit card. But there still is the old fashioned getting your hands, their grimy hands on your credit card. How or, or let's say you have the number stolen and they start using it to make purchases. How confident can you be that the bank or credit card company, we expect that if we pick up the phone and call the bank, they're going to give us our money back. So I say those five transactions that happened in Turkey are not mine. And the credit card company gives me, they go on investigation and then hopefully they give me, it's happened probably eight times in my life. They've always, I've always got my money back. So what are the potential losses there? Well, when you're dealing with a credit card, it's not that much of a problem. You make a phone call, they change a number, you give them information to prove that in fact you weren't in Turkey at the time the credit card was being used. And unlike the old days where you were guilty until proven innocent, because of how this crime has evolved and because of the attention and the emphasis now put on solving that problem, uh, we really have moved into a world of zero liability when it comes to credit cards. Unfortunately, the same is not necessarily true about debit cards, because debit cards, as you know, are the pathway into your bank account. And even if you have a bank that says, OK, we realize it's not you, but we're still going to investigate just to make sure and then we're going to return your money. That delay, that period of time where they investigate. Now, some banks have a 24-hour guarantee, which is you prove to us that it's not you. You get your money back right away. Mm -hmm. Whereas other institutions could take up to a few days. And if this is money that you needed for groceries or rent or tuition or car payments or a mortgage payment, uh you could be having potential issues. It just It's going to require more work to get it done. More of the debit cards are now moving towards zero liability as well. But for a period of time, your bank account could be blocked, at least as to the amounts in dispute. So, so it is actually advisable to carry credit cards over debit cards. I always tell people use a credit card versus a debit card because when it's a credit card, it's their money. When it's a debit card, it's your money. So if you can't get credit cards because you once were an overspender or forgot to pay your bills in your entire 20s and you're working to have that situation be alleviated, but in the time in, in the current time period, you can't get a credit card. Uh, are people still doing the uh, secured secured credit cards? So you put a thousand dollars. Now you have a thousand dollar credit limit. Yeah, some people are doing that. And then, of course, you have the other alternative, too, which is the debit card attached to your bank account. Um, now, there, 
a way to protect yourself is sign up for what's called transactional monitoring alerts. And financial institutions, credit card companies, they all offer programs where they notify you anytime there's activity in your account. Now, people may say, oh, come on. I mean, do I really need to know every penny? And the answer is yes. And here's the reason. Because every day, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of credit cards and debit cards are sold on the dark web uh, by several categories. And one of the categories is zip code. And it's designed when they sell another criminal a credit card or debit card by zip code, it's designed to evade bank tracking systems because financial institutions, credit card companies, they're all looking for out-of-pattern spending, out-of-pattern charging. But if it's the same zip code you normally live in or shop in or work in, the bank may miss it, but you won't. So if you're using for instance, a debit card versus a credit card, because you have no other alternative, you have to sign up for these transactional alerts because you need to know what's going on in your account pretty much every minute of the day. On a daily basis. And so how long do you have to report fraud in a personal checking account? Well, it depends upon the financial institution. I've seen them where they go. If you don't notify us within 60 days, because some some people travel, so they don't really, they're not, Um, they're not as focused on what's going on uh, in their accounts on a daily basis. But they generally want you to do it as quickly as possible so that they can do something about it. So I always say to people, check your accounts, check it on a daily basis, make sure you know what's going on, and that's why transactional alerts are so incredibly important. Mm-hmm. Is it true that you uh, is it still true that you only have three days to report fraud in business accounts? Do you know? Generally, they want you to do it pretty quickly, uh, especially because, you know, business accounts may not receive the same attention that personal accounts do. Right. And there may be more people that have access to business accounts than have personal accounts. Yeah. So, uh, you know, as a result, they really want to know as quickly as possible because They want to do something about it. They want to protect you. But obviously, they're also trying to protect themselves. What do you do when you walk into an emergency room, a doctor's office, a law firm, a gym, a preschool, a nonprofit, and they put a form in front of you and it says, we want your social security number, your address, your date of birth. And you say, I don't really want to give this to you. And they say, well, we won't do business with you without it. Well, I always say to people, don't give them your social security number, that if you're giving them your insurance card, your insurance company already has your social security number information. Mm -hmm. And I have found in most cases where you push back on the social security number, uh, they pretty much back down. But if they refuse to back down, then you just have to say to yourself that I'm going to I'm going to go someplace else, which unfortunately is not an easy thing to do when you walk into an emergency room. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> That's for sure. Kind of tough. But, but it's why, and you know, sometimes you do what you have to do, but understand that medical institutions, medical providers are unfortunately notorious for being sieves when it comes to protecting data. Really? And, and, and there is a difference, and I've tried to explain this to a lot of businesses, there is a difference between being in compliance and being secure. Because you can be totally compliant, but somebody can make a mistake, and in one second, you can go from being compliant and secure to potentially being compliant but insecure because somebody clicked on the wrong link. They made a mistake. They they fell for a phishing attack, and now the institution is exposed. So it's common sense not to give your identifying information to someone who calls you on the phone. But is Never. that the... Okay, so that's the clear decision rule is if I'm going to verbally state my social security number, I called you. I called an 800 number that's on the back of my credit card or the one that's on the bank website. I didn't receive a call. Uh, Are there other tips you can give people about what to say or what questions to ask if they're suspicious or not feeling confident about who they're speaking with? Well, first of all, rule of thumb, whether you're contacted by way of text, email, phone, never, ever, ever authenticate yourself to anyone who contacts you. Only authenticate yourself when you make the phone call 
that you have confirmed uh, independently that the phone number you're calling is the phone number of the institution that you think you're talking to uh, so that you don't get yourself in trouble. If you follow that rule of thumb and then add to that, I do not click on links, I do not open attachments, I go directly to the website, I never download an app from a third party uh, website, that I only go to the specific bank or retailer or, or entity with which I want to do business and I want to have an app, that before I click yes to permissions, uh, when they say, okay, in return for us allowing you to use our app, uh, we want you to agree to all of this, make sure you understand what the all of this is, because you'll be very, very surprised sometimes with what you're agreeing to. And unfortunately, a lot of these things that you're agreeing to are written in 27th grade English in mouse print. <laughs> 27th grade English. That was yeah. funny. Okay, so you got kind of opened a can of worms here. Okay, so you said no downloads, no attachments, no apps, no no portals. No, that's a lot of stuff. I'm well, no, I'm not saying don't go to a port. What I'm saying is if you get an email and in that email says click here, don't go directly to the website that you think. In other words, if you get something from the government, first of all, you're not getting something from the government if it's a phone call or email. Okay. Um, if you get something from your favorite retailer, go to the actual website of the retailer. Now, I know there is this almost obsessive, compulsive thing people do, which is, look, it's a banner. It says I'm going to get the deal of the century or it's from a store that I do business with. They're alerting me to a sale. I guarantee you, if you go to the website for that store, you're going to be able to find the sale. What you don't want to do is get caught up in a situation and, and in a staggering percentage of people are hit with phishing attacks. I mean, every minute of every day, uh, you are hit by email that are phishing email. They may not look like phishing email. They're getting a lot better than they used to be. The colors are better. The logos are better. The grammar and the spelling is better. But that doesn't necessarily mean that what you're seeing is the real deal. So you really have to be careful. So let's think about Let's put it in context. What are we up against? We're up against four kinds of hackers, mm -hmm. state-sponsored hackers, for-profit hackers, cause hackers like you saw with Ashley Madison and with Sony, and then the because I can hacker, or as our president likes to say, the proverbial 400 pound sitting on a mattress in his mother's basement in New Jersey. Doesn't <laughs> matter why you end up in the crosshairs of these hackers. Uh, they all have different reasons. They all have different agendas. They all have different motivations, whether they're gathering information for espionage purposes, whether they're doing it because they want to make money whether they want to disrupt, they want to cause chaos, they are, God help us, some of them are terrorists, some of them are just, they want bragging rights in the hacking community that they did something. So that's can you, what we're Can you today. define a term for me quickly? I have this question for you later on the list, but you brought up the word phishing. Can you define yes. what's phishing and what's spear phishing? Okay, you're bringing me to actually my second point, which is what I call the pantheon of ishings. <laughs> There's phishing, dear card holder, dear member, dear account holder. So it's generalized. Spear phishing, dear Hillary. Vishing, that's voice over internet protocol, which means you get a phone call from a phone number that it, it seems like gibberish. And someone gets on the phone and they're talking to you as if they are the government or your bank or a charity or some other organization that sounds official. And. Uh, or there is smishing, which is SMS text-based phishing. That's where you get a text that goes, your account's been frozen. Click here to re-authenticate yourself, because if you don't, your account's going to be frozen. And you immediately panic. You don't even realize what account it may or may not be. Mm. In some cases, they take a wild guess, and they throw the name of a bank in there and hope that you might be a depositor or a borrower from that bank or an investor that uses that bank's uh, uh, brokerage site. So 
you did. That's why you don't click on links. You don't immediately give away everything on the phone. I had a friend, very sophisticated Wall Street trader, and uh, I had warned him. He read the book. We, we talked about it all the time. He gets a phone call in the middle of the trading day, and they say to him, sir, um, we're with the Internal Revenue Service, so they immediately get his attention. Yeah. And then they say, we know that you were a little bit late last year in your taxes, and he went, oh my gosh, it must be the IRS. They know that. And then they said, we're going to give you the last four digits of your social security number, but to prove you're you, we need you to give us the first five. And he said, as I uttered the numbers, as they left my lips, I said to myself, I got to call Adam. I just messed up. <laughs> yep. But but they're so good at the way they do it. Sometimes they'll call and they'll say, uh, Hillary, this is your credit card number, right? And you go, why, yes, it is. And they say, and this is the expiration date. You go, why, yes, it is. And they go, just to make sure you're you, could you please flip your card over and give us the uh, security code on the back? At that moment, the minute you do that, because you're so focused on everything else going on in your life, they have it. And, and I've seen a further extension of it, which once you give them that information, they go, oh, my gosh, you really are a victim of identity theft. Listen, we want to get the process going. We want to put fraud alerts on your file. We'll even talk about helping you with a credit freeze. Just give us your Social Security number. We'll do the work for you. So you went from giving them your debit or credit card to your life by giving mm -hmm. them your Social Security number. So these are the kinds of things that happen. How do they get away with this? It's very simple. You, me, everybody listening, we all have day jobs. We have families, businesses, charitable endeavors, outside activities. We're busy. But to a hacker, a fisher, an identity thief, we are their day job. Never forget that. So do you recommend freezing your credit? Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Uh, good. So freezing your credit, for those of you who are listening, if you're not aware, you can call up the credit reporting agencies and say, no one can apply for credit in my name until I quote unquote thaw it. So you put a freeze on, then not even you can open a new line of credit, apply for a mortgage, get a loan for a car, anything like that until you thaw your credit. So it makes your credit not, not easily accessible. So I have heard, Adam, that as the number of passwords people are being required to create increases significantly more and more often people are keeping their passwords written on post-it notes in their office and they even use their birthdays or their kids names and it's easy for us to critique these people but remembering hundreds of passwords is impossible so what do you do well first of all i said but you can do a few things you can create a pass code a pass phrase mm -hmm where you could take the first letter of, let's say, your, a favorite quote of yours, take a few of the words. Some people use five words that make absolutely no sense as a string of words. Each word is distinct, but in their heads, they know what the order is. And then they put a couple letters in front that remind them of the website and a number or two at the back that they can remember. But but a simpler way to do it is get a password manager. Mm -hmm. And there, there, there are many good ones. And some even will create very long, strong, and sophisticated passwords. But there's another thing that people have to keep in mind. There is a difference between an indecipherable password, because it could be your passphrase or whatever, and a discovered password. So when you think about the Yahoo breach where 3 billion people were exposed, mm -hmm. it's actually hard to believe that's a number, but that really is a number. And you've had all of these other breaches where their logon credentials have been exposed. So as a result, if they're not encrypted and many of the breached entities did not encrypt the data, then the bad guys have passwords and your email address, because think of how many people are forced to or opt for using their email address as their user ID. So that's why a password manager is is more helpful because it can create new passwords, really, if, if you want, anytime you want, some of them. Uh, some of them, you have to continually come up with new and interesting passwords, then save them into your password manager. And then when you want to do it, you just simply have a pull down menu and click on the name of the website 
and it pre-populates, and, and that's the passphrase or the password they use for that. But so many people use the same passwords. They share them across all of their different platforms, financial, social media, work-related, uh, email, all of that, and they get themselves in harm's way because if you get breached in one place, if you're using the same password, and over 51% of people do, you're exposed every place else. Yeah, so I use one password and folks on my team use LastPass. I assume both of these are acceptable vaults, password uh, yep. aggregators for you. And then so the security of your password vault is, is as complete as, a, as the complexity of the password to get into it. That is that is correct. Right. That is correct. And, and that's not to say that that every so often one or two of them don't get hit. But most I think all of the password management organizations do very, very high level military grade encryption. So even if they're they suffer a breach and somebody gets their hands on the passwords, they are extremely difficult to crack. Mm -hmm. because of the level of encryption that's used by these particular password managers. But another thing that you should do as, you know, again, it's all about what we like to refer to as layered security. So level one is a strong password management protocol. Level two would be two-factor authentication or multi-factor authentication. And that's where, you know, you attempt to uh, uh, log on to a particular website, you suddenly get a note going, unfamiliar device, and then either it says text a code, so it texts the code to your cell phone, and then in order to continue on, you have to enter the code, and then it allows you continue to log on. These are not completely foolproof because there are people out there that do what's called SIM jacking, there are some people that have successfully hijacked cell phone numbers and transferred them to another device. So when the code comes in, it actually goes to the transferred cell phone. They're rare, but it's not impossible. You know, again, in our world, it's think about every horrible thing that could possibly happen. And it probably has. Mm hmm. But the code is good. Now, there's another uh, way that you could do fact two factor authentication, which is security questions and answers. But I always say to people, be careful with security questions and answers because oftentimes the information that you use in your answers to security questions is available in multiple places online through social media where people expose every aspect of their lives. So if you're going to set up your security questions, lie like a superhero. Clark Kent does not tell people he's Superman. Bruce Wayne does not tell people that he's Batman. So don't use your real mother's real maiden name. Correct. Lie like a superhero. All you need to do is make sure that your lies are not so creative that you can't remember them yourself. So then you're shut out of the website. Right. But, you know, make it somewhat simple. Make it unique. Make it something that you can remember and know that for all of these websites, if you give them the answer to a security question when you first set them up, no one is going to conduct a background investigation like you're getting a security clearance and say, come on, Hillary, that's not your mother's real maiden name. Right. All they all they care about is when they ask you the question, you provide the answer that you gave them when you set it up. So what about mail and personal physical documents? Uh, everything comes in the mail. Should I shred everything? Do I scan it and upload it to a secure in the cloud storage place or not? And what about unsolicited credit card applications? Do those need to be shredded? When it comes to an unsolicited credit card application, absolutely you got to shred it. Okay. Because if you just throw it out, there are people that they go, can go through, in your trash and fill it out for you, right? Yeah, they're happy to do it. Yeah. <laughs> I, you know, I had a story. One fellow that we were helping at Cyber Scout, he said, you know, the guy that stole my credit actually has better credit than I do. I think I'll stick with him. But the truth is that in most cases, this is not what you want. So shred anything that's a pre-approved application, although we all know that pre-approved doesn't necessarily really mean pre-approved. 
But if they put in a pre-approved application, they're going to be going off your credit. So therefore, you want to shred it. Any document that has sensitive information on it, once you're done with it, you want to shred. For instance, when you travel, what you may want to do is upload whatever information you need to identify yourself in the event that you lose your purse or wallet. But make sure that you either put it in an extremely secure thumb drive that you carry with you or upload it into the cloud, uh, which is secure. But remember, you know, even the cloud can be invaded, unfortunately. How many times have we read about the discovery of all kinds of sensitive information that was sitting on, let's say, an AWS server that the company that was storing it didn't properly secure it and just assumed that the cloud storage company was going to provide 100% of security, which they don't necessarily do. It's kind of a shared responsibility. Uh, to be honest with you, I'm not even sure I would trust myself. I mean, I give myself like a B minus, B, B, maybe somewhere in the B range in terms of computer adeptness and sophistication and the idea of me password protecting a USB drive and carrying it with me. I don't think I would even really trust myself with that because I, I don't know that I would have the confidence that if some thief puts this in their, US, their, their USB port, they can't get the data off of it. Does that require a high level of technical skill? A lot of thieves, not necessarily, unless it's an encrypted thumb drive and you haven't used password as your password. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Thank you. And I, and I always love, you know, people password, but then they use a zero as opposed to an O. Oh, or a dollar sign as opposed to an S. But that's another thing, too. If you're creating your own passwords, swap out numbers for letters and symbols for letters. And But, but again, it is much more difficult for someone to crack your password if you're using a passphrase. But don't use a passphrase that everybody who knows you knows. Oh, gosh, that's Hillary loves to say that all the time. Right. <laughs> or if you saw the movie Interstellar, do not go gently into that good night. You know, that one's kind of out there a little bit. Or the quick brown fox jumped over the fence. That's kind of been there. Uh-huh. Right. Okay. So use a use a line from Hotel California by the Eagles, right? Something like that. <laughs> just, just make sure it's a really obscure line from the Eagles. <laughs> so if someone gets onto your network in your home, can they then get onto your computer? Oh, well, if they're into your network, they've pretty much gotten somehow through your computer into your network, or they certainly will go from the network into your computer. Really? Even if you have a complex password on your computer? Because the next time you go onto your network, they're sitting there. Mm. So when your computer and your network are now bonding, they're sliding through. And all they need is one slight crack or crevice. Give you an interesting example. Somebody that I know in Europe who is a gray hat hacker, that means depending upon the day of the week, they're either the good guy or the not so good guy, uh -huh. was actually trying to demonstrate a point to somebody in his neighborhood. She was a cat lover and he knew she was a cat lover because he followed her on social media. And so he sent her pictures of cats. She clicked on the cat picture he had malicious code. The code got into her home network. He knew that her husband was the CFO of a multinational oil company. And he basically used access into her network to get into her husband's network at work. And he got his hands on the financials for a multinational oil company. Oh, my. Uh, OK, so good. Complex passwords on the home network. Yes. Well, they, not only that, and so now here's another, since we're talking about scary things. So we're living in a world where we have 10 billion, again, Dr. Evil, Pinky the Libs B, 10 billion Internet of Things devices and growing geometrically. Within five years, they assume we're going to be at 50 billion. And each one of these devices is listening, tracking, monitoring, Originally, the whole concept of connected devices was how can we make everything more convenient and how can we make these devices talk to each other and then communicate with manufacturers so we can figure out ways to make it even more useful and beneficial and convenient for, for consumers. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, 
they all come with manufacturer default passwords, all of which are available for sale on the dark web, because most of the folks that are producing uh, connected devices were more concerned about how do I make a really cool connected device uh, than how do I protect this cool connected device from somebody finding a way to uh, crawl through a vulnerability and use that then to leapfrog into somebody's home or business network. And if you think about what they are, it's everything from HVAC systems, security systems, like Nest, for instance, not Nest per se, but I mean, you know, anything that that is controlling a smart home. You're also talking about baby monitors. Uh, you're talking about big screen TVs, computers with cameras in them. Big screen TVs? Yeah, big screen TVs. They have, like Samsung issued a warning a couple of years ago saying that, you know, we've created this device with the ability to listen for the purpose of one day you giving it voice commands and it changing channels. So, oh, by the way, you need to disable this device uh, in order to make sure that you're completely secure. This is not atypical of what's going on. I mean, we when you think about some of the huge ransomware attacks that occurred, uh, they occurred because botnets were created stringing together these robot armies of connected devices. Here's a scary one. So Ben-Gurion University did a study and determined that if an attacker simply strung together 2,000 cell phones, that it, you know, it found vulnerabilities, got them, and turned them into a robot army, it could shut down a 911 system for a state. 6,000 strung together could literally shut down most emergency systems in the United States. So it's a very dangerous thing. That's why we tell people when you get a connected device and hopefully legislation will be coming to say that at some point in our not too distant future, if a consumer buys a connected device and wants to plug it into a network, it will not work unless and until that consumer creates a long and strong password that is replacing the default password in that connected device. Think about hospitals, one big connected device. In offices, printers, fax machines, phones, big screen TVs, the computers with all of the cameras and microphones in them. I mean, the, just the list goes on and on. The ultimate connected device, the ultimate data storage device. Your iPhone. Bingo. And, you know, a lot of people look at and go, oh, it's a communication device. Uh-uh. It's a data storage device. And everybody tends to store everything in their phone. And that's why so many businesses, even though they're adopting these BYOD or bring your own device policies because it, it increases employee productivity, uh, to some of us, we think of them as BYOB or bring your own bomb because you could blow up an entire business based on malware that may be coming through your cell phone into the network at your business. And, and how does it get there? How many times have you been to a restaurant with a child and you'll do anything, anything to calm them down because you want to have a peaceful dinner. You don't want the banging on the table, the screaming, the running up and down. So here, here's my phone or, hey, I brought you an iPad. And unfortunately, children, when it comes to electronic devices, can be weapons of mass destruction. So that's why it's so important for people to secure their mobile devices, for businesses to have strict mobile device protection protocols. And in some cases, businesses are saying, we're going to give you this smartphone. We're going to give it to you, but you can only use it for the business. And we're putting special security software on this device that will literally not allow you to download anything else. If only the president of the United States had a device like that before he tweeted. <laughs> I'm going to keep that man off Twitter. So you're obviously talking about devices such as Alexa. You mentioned many others. Specifically, I do see people running around with tape over the cameras on their laptop camera, you know, the camera lens on their laptop. Uh, I myself don't have an Alexa in my house. And my daughter, who will turn three in about two weeks, uh, has a toy, and every once in a while, about once a day, it says, hi, 
connect me to your internet. Tell me your name and we can get to know each other. And I find this to be the creepiest invitation to get closer to a toy, right? And, you know, my response is, heck no. <laughs> uh, no, you're, you're, a, you're a thousand percent. Well, do you remember when VTech, which was a huge manufacturer of children's toys, developed these interactive toys and they got breached? And they ended up with pictures of parents and chats between parents and kids. And, oh, you know, no, I don't remember that. And, you know, at the risk of having Jeff Bezos immediately chase me around New York City and try to kill me. The truth of the matter is that these devices, while they are incredible when it comes to creating convenience in all of our lives, they're opening us up to all kinds of vulnerabilities. So. We need to put long and strong passwords when we connect these devices. Now, more and more, you go into a hotel room and they go, look, we have your voice assistant. It's estimated there'll be 275 million uh, voice uh, or smart speakers uh, in the next three to five years all over the world. And you got to be really careful. I generally, if I find it in a hotel, I unplug it, I hug it. And then I place it outside the door of my room and I call the front desk and say, take it. And many hotels now allow you to call down and say, by the way, can you please get this thing out of my room? Because I don't really need it listening to me. So any type of smart device is listening, potentially recording and maybe even uploading any conversation that you have in the room, right? It's entirely possible. And even though a lot of them say, you know, we're very safe, we're very secure, we don't do it. Hasn't you haven't you get a little creeped out every so often when Siri goes, can I help you? And you didn't say, hey, Siri, I have Siri shut off. I think I'm just naturally paranoid. (laughs) I I don't like help from computers. I'll do it myself. Thank you. (laughs) And I'm not even that old. Right. I'm like I'm the smack dab in the middle of Gen X. And uh, I, I just have a natural I'm a late adopter in terms of technology. So I myself don't do much of the. I guess, computer assisted things that people do these days. Plus, I'm a financial advisor. So I think I'm naturally, most financial advisors care deeply and fear deeply in terms of a a data breach or something like that. So I protect myself and my business. (laughs) Well, it's very important because I have to tell you that you are unique to that. You would be shocked or probably not to realize How many people, especially if they work in either small offices or they work out of their homes, are not secure? They have an enormous amount of data. And unfortunately, when that data gets breached, it can be devastating for the people who are the collateral damage. You know, and I go back to, you know, there were great phrases in World War II, like loose lips sink Sink ships, ships. right? (laughs) Another one I love is know your place, shut your face. And unfortunately, now it's be too lax, your Equifax. I mean, if you think about it, 150 million people had their Social Security information exposed. Yeah. Now, you add that to the breaches of Anthem, Premira, Excellus, the United States Office of Personnel Management. And with all of those, you have to assume that there are some overlapping Social Security numbers. You have pretty much most of the American people right there. And now, welcome to today's Money Wise segment, where we make you a little bit wiser about money, but most definitely smarter than your neighbor. Today, we're talking about resulting. Resulting is a mistake that poker players and investors make, but after today, you won't make it anymore. Let me provide you some context. Take a second, and I want you to think of the best decision you've ever made, the best one. Okay, now take a second and think about the worst decision you've ever made, the absolute worst. If you believe in regret, you regret it big time. Now, I would be willing to bet that the worst decision you've ever made in your mind had a bad outcome and the best decision you've ever made in your mind had a good outcome, that you judge the quality of your decision or choice based on the result. Now, poker players make this mistake too. 
And Annie Duke, who is the only woman to have won the World Series of Poker Tournament of Champions and the NBC National Heads Up Poker Championship, Annie Duke points out that poker players who make good choices from a statistical standpoint, so let's say you're holding a hand, your your pocket hand in Texas Hold'em, your pocket hand is uh, the ace king, and you go all in, and you lose. Well, now you think that was a bad decision, but statistically speaking, that's a winning hand. And investors do the same thing. So I'll give you two examples of when investors might do this. For example, right now, tech stocks are hot. Okay, so I see people who are holding on to large concentrations of Apple stock or Nvidia stock and, and, and they're doing that at the cost of or at the opportunity cost of diversifying into a portfolio that has a history of returns behind it. And they think that they're really smart. Worse, people who started picking stocks at the beginning of the bull market and have been winning or beating the market for the last nine to 10 years think they're really great at picking stocks. They're just riding the tide that's rising, rising all boats. Conversely, and it's just the opposite, if you did diversify a single stock and you came out of your company stock and into a diversified portfolio and that company stock took off, you might now think that that was a bad decision decision when statistically speaking, diversifying out of a single stock is probably a great decision because now you no longer suffer single company risk. So that in poker is what Annie Duke and other expert poker players refer to as resulting. So don't let your hindsight view of a choice impact good future statistical choices, smart choices, okay? The law of large numbers says, if you continue to make choices that are based on statistical evidence, you will do better in the long run. There you go. Hey, Profit Boss. If after listening to today's episode, you think you might be ready to take meaningful actions with your wealth and perhaps consider working with me and my firm in some way, then I'd love to hear from you. Just go to hillaryhendershot.com forward slash hello. That's Hillary with one L and Hendershot with two T's dot com slash hello. When I'm not sitting behind the mic, I'm running Hendershot Wealth Management. We're a fee only fiduciary financial advisory firm. We work with women and couples to take their finances to the next level. Everything I talk about here on the show gets personalized and put to work for my clients. So I ask you. Why wait till tomorrow when you can start realizing your full wealth potential today? The life you want to live, it doesn't have to wait. Just imagine the freedom and joy you'll experience when you've secured your retirement and enjoyed the years leading up to it. That's what I want for you. That's what I do for my clients. And if that's what you want for yourself, just head on over to my website right now, hillaryhendershot.com slash hello. All of our initial conversations are totally complimentary. So let's just see where a friendly conversation may lead. hillaryhendershot.com slash hello. I came up with this framework called the three M's. You have to say to yourself, look, it would be great to believe that we can prevent identity theft, but we really can't. And anyone that tells you they can, they need to be the real CEO of Disneyland because you can't. That breaches have become the third certainty in life behind death and taxes. Just the way it is, because there's too much information, too much information is out there. That information in the hands of the wrong people can be used to garner additional information. So therefore, we have to look at the world now in a framework of the three M's. First is, how do you minimize your risk of exposure, reduce your attackable surface? And we talked a lot about it. You have strong password protocol. You use two-factor authentication. You don't click on links. You don't open attachments you don't understand. You don't authenticate yourself to people that you don't know that you never uh, give information to someone who calls you on the phone. You're very careful about anything that happens in terms of uh, a text that comes to you. You secure your mobile devices, and there are different uh, security things that, that you can do, that software is available for now more and more for that, that you freeze your credit, that you don't go to 
third party sites and just like a crazy person download apps and control your instincts about, oh my gosh, that's the newest, coolest thing I've ever seen. I have to have it right now. Let me give it every possible permission I can possibly forgive it, give it. In addition to which, you don't save your user ID and password on the app on your phone. Right. That even though it's a little bit of a pain in the butt, that you uh, you enter it each time you use the app. And that uh, when it comes to browsing on your mobile device, it's better to actually only browse on secure networks. Don't use free public Wi-Fi because it could get very expensive in the end because you could be open to what's called man-in-the-middle attacks when you think you're actually communicating with an institution and you're communicating through someone who has found a way onto your phone by way of, of uh, free public Wi-Fi. Use VPNs or virtual private networks. Uh, you can get some free, and, and there, there are sites that operate as VPNs, and, and you can research them. Always read reviews before you download anything, before you go to any website that you think is real. So that's the, the first M. The second M, which is monitor. And now for consumers, because businesses and consumers are a little different, but for consumers, go to annualcreditreport.com. Get a free copy of your credit report. Read it. Don't just go, look, I got a free copy of my credit report. You got to read it. Make sure you understand everything that's on it. If you see something that doesn't make sense, say something. Don't go, oh, it must be a mistake. Monitor your credit scores. If your credit score takes a sudden precipitous drop without explanation, it could be one of three reasons. And as a financial expert, you'll appreciate these, right? Yep. One, you didn't pay your bill on time. Two, you used too much of your available credit. Or three, you're a victim of identity theft. None of those options are good. The third could be the worst. The third thing is, as we talked earlier, sign up for transactional monitoring alerts that notify you anytime there's activity in your account. Also, when you get explanation of benefit statements from your medical provider, read them. You might be surprised to find out it wasn't you, mm -hmm. that someone actually stole your information, used your insurance, and then had an examination in your name, had treatment in your name. I mean, medical identity theft is a serious problem. It impacts millions of people that we've seen everything from a woman walking into the office of a hospital administrator, throwing both legs up on his desk and saying, do I look like a W amputee to, to you? <laughs> to people getting it to psychiatrists that were inventing files for the purpose of defrauding government benefits programs. And that information got out there to people getting medical treatment. And then you suddenly being notified by a creditor that you owe money to a medical provider or a hospital that you had no idea you did, and now you've got a credit issue, you've got a financial issue, read those explanation of benefit statements. And the last part of that M is also, there are more sophisticated monitoring programs available through the credit reporting agencies, through third-party sites, credit.com, Credit Karma, Credit Sesame, sites like that. and not just monitor your credit, monitor your identity. You need to know what's going on with your social security number at all times. Because sometimes if you're notified that something is going on with your social security number or your name or your address, it, this may be happening in preparation to do an assault on your credit. So you want sophisticated monitoring and specific, specifically you want monitoring that is lovingly referred to as me, not me, which means instead of someone saying, you know, a few days ago, someone using your information, to open an account you want, someone's using your information to open an account right now. Is it you? Yes or no? Because if you click no, bells, whistles, alarms go off, things stop, people are notified you need to do that. So that's the second M. And then the third M, which is shorter but sweet, is that, look, you need to manage the damage. Now, you can do it yourself, which means that essentially you have no life. 
You'll jeopardize your working career because you're going to be so focused in the identity theft problem. You're going to be gathering all sorts of information. You're going to be trying to reach out to people whose phone numbers you don't know and then trying to anticipate every possible place that your information could be out there and you're trying to help yourself on this. Or what a lot of people don't realize is now through their insurance uh, provider, their financial services organization, or their employer, there are programs available now to help them through identity incidents, in some cases even for free as a perk of your relationship with the institution. Mm -hmm. So contact your insurance agent, your financial services rep, or the HR department where you work and say, do you have a program to help me through an identity incident? Am I in it? If not, what do I have to do to get in it? Is it free or what's it going to cost? And then, you know, make the decision. But trust me, this will be one of the cheapest investments you can make. And here's an interesting factoid. Right now, about a third of all employers offer as an employee benefit, either paid by employer or voluntary, identity protection and identity theft assistance programs. It is estimated that in the next three to four years, that will go up to 75% of all employers. Are there identity theft or protection services that you recommend? My impression is that freecreditreport.com, for example, simply signs you up for a massive amount of spam. Well, <laughs> well you know, but that, that is Experian, and Experian does have very good resolution programs and great monitoring programs, but Equifax, although they've had, as you know, certain issues of late, but Equifax has a program, TransUnion has a program, our, our programs are available through institutions with providers, like one I know very well, but I won't mention, discretion being the better part of valor. But it's very important to do research. Now, if you want to find out great questions to ask and how to best analyze both monitoring and identity theft protection services, the Consumer Federation of America, a wonderful consumer organization, mm -hmm. has created a site called idtheftinfo.org, where a lot of the identity service providers have signed a best practices pledge, and everyone agrees that they're going to use real statistics. They're not going to promise stuff that they can't really deliver. And it's got a lot of terrific information on it. The FTC has great information, ftc.gov on its website. Identity Theft Resource Center, which you well know in Southern California, uh, they're in San Diego, is a not-for-profit identity theft service protection organization where they help people get through these incidents. Uh, so there are resources out there. There are organizations available to help. There are are many different programs that you pay for. There are some iconic names in the consumer area that, that people all know that have been involved in identity theft protection. So uh, there is help out there. And some people go, I can do it for free. Why would I do? The answer is, yeah, you could change your muffler and change your oil for free too, but that doesn't mean you're going to do it. So if you're going to do it, make sure that you do the research and you find one that's best for you. So in conclusion... You, <laughs> you you don't necessarily want to mention any of the services specifically. I get it. You're an expert in the field. So you're, you're for the most part, agnostic about what service you use. But the point is, use one. I really think you need to use one. I mean, I own one. That's why I have to be right? careful about it. So, <laughs> so I don't want to, you know, look like I'm either favoring or casting aspersions on anyone. And there are some well-known ones that have had some problems with the FTC. And there are other ones that are very well-known that have done that have done great work that are highly respected. And if you go to uh, idtheftinfo.org, you're mm -hmm. going to get kind of the good lowdown on it. Um, you know, you can also check with the Consumer Affairs Division of your state uh, or the Attorney General's office and say, you know, have you had any complaints filed against these providers? Are they doing a good job? Are they not doing a good job? And, and you know, you'll, you'll get a lot of really good information out there. The key thing is this. When you're talking about anything other than changing a credit card number and maybe a debit card number, once you start moving up the identity theft food chain, when new accounts being opened, information about your, your medical thing, stuff out there, fake tax returns being filed, 
you get a notice from the IRS saying you've woefully underreported your income because unbeknownst to you, someone using your social security number has gotten work and that income is being reported to you through your social security number to a crime has been committed and you open up your door and there are guys with guns standing there with an arrest warrant, you're going to need help, professional help, people who can get you through this. And that's why it's very important to do research on services and then do it. Do it. Take action. So the three M's, just to reiterate, and first of all, I did type idtheftinfo.org when you said it, and we'll make sure that one specifically goes in the show notes. The three M's to repeat are minimize your exposure. Right. Minimize your risk of exposure, Mm -hmm. reduce your attackable service, monitor, and then manage the damage and live by those three M's. And, you know, the truth is a lot of people sort of intrinsically, they know this, but they need it in a framework that's accessible, that helps them understand it. And that's why I created the three M's. And I think it it, I think it'd be very helpful for people to kind of live by them. It is really helpful to give people philosophies and frameworks and distinctions to think from. So, and it helps me too. I think that I've certainly been in all three positions over the course of my life. I assume I'm a normal American, maybe eight to 10 fraudulent charges on my accounts. Not a big deal. Got the money back. So I'm lucky, but I'm also pretty protective of my information. So tell me just briefly, tell us a little bit about credit.com. Well, credit.com We started it back in 1994, went online in 94, and it's one of the real original dot-com financial services companies. Okay. And has has grown exponentially. I sold the company uh, three years ago, but very proud of what we accomplished. Uh, And I think that it's, it's, it's an advocate, an educator, and a marketplace for consumer products and services in the credit area. And was originally created with the philosophy that educated consumers are the best risk for financial institutions. And it's very important for a consumer to truly understand where he or she sits in the credit universe and not to apply for things that they're not really ready to apply for, not to get themselves in over their heads. Mm -hmm. And that, that credit can be a friend. And I realize people go, nobody thinks credit is your friend. But if you think about credit in terms of friendship, you get out of a friendship what you put into it. Mm -hmm. If you pay attention to your friend, if you're there for your friend, if you nurture your friend, they'll be there for you. And I talk to people about what I call the three portfolio theory. And that is that when you say the word portfolio, and as an investment person, you'll appreciate this, that the Pavlovian response is investments. But what people don't really think about is we have so many different portfolios in our lives, but three of the big ones are credit, identity, and investments. And each one needs to be built, nurtured, managed, and protected. Now, in the financial area, we all hope to find the right financial manager who can nurture, build, protect our investments. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to credit and identity, The ultimate guardian of the consumer is the consumer. We have to be the professional manager of our credit and our identity. And we're the ones that are going to build it, protect it, and nurture it. Nobody knows as much as we do about what we do than you and me. No one else, no third party is going to, oh, you did this. You're going to, well, how do you know? You don't know uh, where you know where you charged your credit card last. You know if you went to the ATM machine around the corner. You know when you get an explanation of benefit statements from your insurance provider that on the date you supposedly had that treatment, you were five states away. So that wasn't you. You know when you look at your credit report and you see something that goes, I have never had an account with that bank or with that credit card company. I don't own that particular car. That's not the address that I have my mortgage on. What is that? So it's all about the fact that, look, we didn't ask for it as consumers, but we now have a shared responsibility because unfortunately government hasn't done enough to protect us. Business hasn't done enough to protect us. And in the world with all of these connected devices, 
you even wonder whether anybody can totally protect us. So that means we have a shared responsibility that we have to know what's going on in our lives. We have to look at our credit. We have to make sure we understand what's going on with our identity. We have to know who to pick up the phone and call if we have a problem. Not, I have a problem. Oh, let me figure out who I have to call. It's too late already. And if you assume that all our information is out there already and that we are all targets already, that means that we have to be vigilant. And we cannot assume, as we talked about early in the show, Ain't going to happen to me because trust me, it's going to happen to you. Yeah, I think that really is the conclusion is that people need to realize this is probably going to happen to you. So you need to have a policy in place, if not written, at least understood and internalized. So, Adam, as you know, and I shared with you in the pre-chat is that when I really got into your book, I realized that this one conversation is just not going to cover it. So on Profit Boss Radio, I'm going to be covering this topic for an entire month. We will be providing best practices document to clients and it'll be available in the show notes on the website. I really can't thank you enough. I'm going to go ahead and wrap up this part of the interview, but it's clear to me that you really have a mission. And first of all, I'm a little scared right now, (laughs) but I think maybe that's part of your mission is to scare people because we have to get to action. We really have to be motivated to action and that, that will become my, my mission of the month. Well, fantastic. And again, scaring is caring, but most importantly, when it comes to this, we all have to be proactive. We cannot be reactive because it's too late. Perfect. Be proactive. Be very protective. I like it. Okay. There you go. Adam, thank you so much. We appreciate your time. Thank you so much for inviting me. As we wrap things up here for today, I need to review with you the things I have to disclose as a fiduciary financial advisor offering wealth management services through my firm, Hendershot Wealth Management LLC. You should know that the opinions I express on Profit Boss Radio are my own and they can change. The content I provide in the show is for general education. It's not intended as specific investment advice, nor do I recommend any specific financial products. Unlike how I roll at home with my husband, I can't guarantee that my statements, opinions, or forecasts are always 100% right. Of course, I wish I could peek into that proverbial crystal ball, but so far I haven't found it. Past performance is not indicative of future results. I talk a lot about indexes and I want you to know you can't actually buy an index because of course, when you take a list of companies and create a product that allows people to invest in those companies, there are fees and expenses involved that reduce returns. Remember, all investing involves risk, which as you know, means you could lose your money. And I have to tell you that there is no guarantee that any investment plan or strategy will be successful. And that should keep my lawyers happy. Have a great day.